describe her as a single woman who took on and defeated the might of the Indian government might be accurate, but it would hardly do her justice, because she's also a heroine, and for millions she's an inspiration. So what is she like? Well, so far she hasn't revealed her personality in public, but let's hope that changes as I introduce you today to Medha Patkar. Welcome to the program, Medha. You know, those who know you say that you were probably made for the Narmada Andolan. 17 years after you launched it, do you think you could ever have done anything else? I could have done many things, uh, no doubt, and especially the reconstructive and regenerative work uh, which I was already in, whether in Bombay slums or in the tribal areas of Gujarat before I came to Narmada. But I feel Narmada is an issue which is not just limited to yes or no to big dams and that is really a micro reality that reflects macro level complexity of uh, what happens between the state and the people with natural resources, the life support in between. You know, it's very interesting. You say you could have done so many other things. Your mother says there was a time when you were determined to be a doctor. What stopped you? I must confess, uh, it was because I lost my first class and that was because um, I was fully engrossed in the extracurricular activities whether it was dramatics, poetry or what not. You just didn't have enough time to study. and debate. Uh, I did study, but I thought uh, limiting to the uh, study of physical sciences, which I was very much in, was not really satisfying me. And I was more attending the classes of arts and the uh, poetry than uh, my own practicals. And the competitions uh, all over uh, which I participated to bring back the medals uh, was also most attractive uh, issues of debate and discussion. Your parents say that you had a very unique way of practicing for all these debates and elocution tests you used to go in for. Do you remember how you did this? Yes, a number of things. And my parents were especially taking care. My father, being a freedom fighter himself, uh, was uh, really particular about the content. And I remember if I write down something, he would throw it back into the waste paper basket if that was very complicated, uh, which I still happen to write uh, the way. But uh, my mother was particularly about the expressions and the performance. And I remember one thing like um, practicing before the mirror. And she always said, you must look into the eyes of the audience uh, if you are not telling anything uh, lie. And uh, that really works, I think, uh, whether it is at the very, very local community level, in a small group, or in a large public, you know, you dare say what you want to confidently and clearly. And uh, that comes through the elocution. And uh, debate, of course, helps you to have an argument and an anti-argument. And um, all that really leads to a climax at points. Which so the you fierce to debates handle. that you have today all go back to the ones you used to have when you were just a young little child. Yes, partly, because that was a great experience. Uh, reading uh, enormously of various issues, the similar agreement at one level and the freedom movement on the other and so on was really wonderful and that built You my won child. all the prizes in school, didn't you? Were you ever embarrassed by the fact that you were so good at everything you did? Not really. I mean, I was most humble and that's what uh, my teachers, parents and so many around me taught and uh, I'm thankful to that. I never felt arrogant because uh, that was a small little field and arena of competition but that really, uh, on one hand, uh, it might change your life uh, only to be with a competitive spirit, but uh, I don't think that happened with me, frankly, because uh, that also gives you a responsibility to really prepare yourself with hard work, honesty, genuinity, and in-depth uh, investigation into any issue or topic that you take up. That's and interesting. That was most important. You talk about responsibility. There was a particular article you wrote for the school magazine that won the best magazine article award, but the prize, in fact, went to someone else. What exactly happened? You must have really researched into my childhood, but uh, it was not just one article, really uh, so many articles and poems that I had written. My whole book rather was taken by my teacher and uh, all those appeared in everyone else's names. And one of course was in mine, but one of mine which was in someone else's name won the award. So. It was not seen as injustice or something, but it hurt as a child. And More than hurt, you were crying uh, at the time, weren't you? 
I don't know, it was a small little incident, it became big unnecessarily, I felt shy about it also, but uh, I enjoyed also sharing with others uh, all that uh, was my creation. Your biographers talk of another incident that happened when you were a child. They say there was an occasion when you went with your mother to buy a pink frock and coming back you encountered an elderly beggar at the bus stop. What exactly happened? This kind of incidences, I think, come, we come across in our childhoods often, and uh, that builds one's own sensitivity to the poverty and squalor in this country. And uh, that happened with me, not just through one experience, which might have been quoted somewhere, but uh, so many. And fortunately, in my family, it was always the talk about. Uh, the poor, the urban and rural poor, the laborers, my father being a labor union uh, leader activist uh, since freedom movement and since he was out of jail after one year's imprisonment. It was all in a small room, we didn't have space to really sit peacefully and study and that's how our offices of the Andolan today are. <laughs> But um, we really enjoyed uh, that kind of interaction and I could learn a lot through observation and um, you know the empathizing kind of experience that you go through when things are happening in that way around you whether it was during the electoral political uh, movements that my parents were in or through some youth organization which they belong to the values that they cherished, the values that they inculcated in us as their children and so on. You know, hearing you talk about your childhood, I get the impression that you were a precocious, self-aware child. Is that what it felt like when you were in your teens? I never was uh, an analyst at that time. And today, I, if I look back, uh, I think because I was also the uh, eldest and only daughter in the family, and uh, was to uh, was made to share a lot of responsibility and so on. But uh, I was uh, not brought up as a daughter or a girl, uh, and was given a lot of confidence and was made aware of uh, myself uh, without the arrogance that could have uh, gone with it. Of I course, your really younger brother. To that. Your younger brother says that she was also a commanding sister and she could be a little bit of a headmistress at times. Is he being unfair? For him, I was and I am even today because he's my younger brother after all. Uh, still maybe I am more of a perfectionist and with my colleagues also, I think I do injustice sometimes, but uh, that's I am. They were just the two of you in the family. Were you very close to each other, you and your brother? Yes, and even today we are, although we have very different paths <laughs> to follow. But you still are the elder sister and you still tell him what you think he should be doing. I do. He may or may not listen to me. Now he's an architect, uh, full-fledged, well-settled uh, professional. You know, let's go back to your family. Your father was a trade unionist and as you mentioned earlier, he was a freedom fighter. Your mother used to be a member of several women's organizations. How much of today's Medha is a product of that childhood? I just said that uh, I am born out of that and uh, the parents uh, who would never discuss uh, anything about money or ornaments or just career for the sake of career always would encourage me to take up social issues and social work and I mean they were wanting me to pursue my first class career also simultaneously and academic merit mattered but uh, at the same time they were very keen to give a wider experience so every Sunday to be spent in the slums in Bombay and uh, taking up the NSS camps and organizing work camps and um, workshops for the students and youths throughout uh, the vacation life and so on was really encouraged by them. Yes. But beyond parents, there were also a number of uh, socialist youth organizations which I was a part of and that also gave me lot of experience, uh, value framework, ideology, which uh, I still carry. You know, it sounds like a very rewarding, dedicated, almost a noble childhood. Was it fun? There was, of course. I enjoyed whatever I did. I never repented uh, about whether it was poetry, dramatics, uh, paintings, or uh, whether it was uh, singing, mm -hmm. dancing, academic career, or work with the poor local. But the interesting thing is you remember your childhood in terms of achievement or social work or in terms of what you did at school. 
not in terms of naughtiness and pranks. Were you naughty as well or was Medha always a good girl? I don't remember being naughty, but <laughs> my mother would remember certainly being the same. How did you come to be the lady who formed the Narmada Andolan? At what point did this become your mission and your cause? It was not uh, one single turning point as it uh, apparently happens to some uh, of the activists or uh, other careerists. But uh, I was already working in the tribal areas of Gujarat and also I had been to and associated with number of rural organizations uh, as much as with the urban poor in Maharashtra. And uh, I happened to see one thing happening and that was the land, water, forest, uh, minerals, uh, all that was there in the tribal region was becoming the thing for the urban, industrial, consumerist developing world. And they wanted to take over that by hook or crook. So the problem of the tribal areas, as I have always been saying, it was the encroachment by the outsiders. And uh, in the name of uh, development, the state itself would do it or support it, whether it is supporting a private company by acquiring land from the tribals and handing over to the company or supporting a project that would draw the resources from the tribal regions but hand it over to the urban industrial rich regions and sections of our population. And that was uh, what in my mind when I happened to come to the villages in Narmada and walking across the hills and mountain ranges of Satpudas in Maharashtra first, reached uh, every hamlet and every village uh, and uh, hours of walk and hours long meetings uh, with the community whose language uh, I did not understand then, although now I know the tribal dialects, but uh, not really um, being able to investigate into their culture and their natural environs uh, so easily. It took a long time really to reach out to them. But, but at one that or two time meetings. when you were doing this, did you realize that this was going to take over your life? Or was it just for you it one step not, at a time? It was not a conscious design and certainly not a conspiracy against the state either. But it was uh, with full awareness of uh, what it would, it could lead to. Because uh, basically I selected to jump into Narmada and uh, settling all other colleagues of mine in the other tribal and rural regions where also I was working. For example, in the northeast tribal belt of Gujarat. Because I thought that there was a great potential raising the issues uh, within that micro level reality which was in the valley of Narmada. A macro complexity as I said in the beginning could be brought to the fore. And that really required hard work. There was no way to reach out to the distant villages in but sense, walking. In a sense, the hard work challenged you. Yes, and uh, no one else you can really get to the area unless you yourself jump into it. And uh, that's my habit as well. If I pick up something, I take it to its logical end. And then it grew and it spread and it took me to Madhya Pradesh and to Gujarat itself. Medha, let's and take then, a break there. I want to come back in part two and talk about this phenomenon that grew and spread, as you say, and became your life. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stay with us. Welcome back. My guest is Medha Patkar. Medha, let's talk about your involvement in the Andolan. Over the last 17 years, you suffered several hardships personally. For instance, in 91, you went through a 22-day hunger strike. Were you ever scared that this might impair your health, perhaps even seriously? Not a bit. <laughs> but I must tell you that all my colleagues work hard and there are hundreds and thousands of people who are always with us in every mass action. And uh, even on fast, uh, there have been representatives of the Adivasis and the pigeons in the valley. And uh, every time the fast is taken, it's at the end of a particular phase of struggle, you see. And when you realize that unless uh, this much happens, uh, you can't move ahead and you can't leave the state without responding at least that much. And that's where the fast kind of action comes in. Is and that also where you get your strength from? The fact that it's part of a mission and a cause and that it's greater than any individual? Oh yes, fast is always added to the strength, the inner and the outer both. You mentioned uh, your colleagues a moment ago. They say that she's a bundle of energy, but do you ever get depressed? 
I am uh, even for a moment uh, they pull me out of it. <laughs> so the credit goes to all around me. But I don't remember having so depressed as to not to work. Rather, if uh, any kind of blow comes in that uh, beyond a moment uh, adds to the strength and the challenge. What about October 2000 when the Supreme Court verdict went against you? That must have been a low, bad moment for you. The judgment doesn't uh, didn't go fully against us. The minority judgment of the present Chief Justice was in our favour, and unfortunately. The another one uh, certainly gave a blow not just to Narmada, but all those who are seeking democratic behavior by the state. But, but I want to know how it affected you, because 17 years of struggle, and then came this blow. Was that not a depressing it moment? It was a blow, but uh, people saw it again as a challenge, because uh, we were not uh, the people who deny the place and role and relevance of judiciary, but we thought that... Uh, uh, the feelings within our hearts which proved to us and that is what is happening today that they have no way to rehabilitate lakhs of people should be held on to and be established now again not only through facts and figures but through our actions. That's what we do and the dam is, remains stopped. It seems to me that at every point you keep rededicating yourself to the central work that you do. That's important to keep remembering the core. Yes, and the cause is much wider, but then you can't ignore lakhs of people for whom there is no land and they are on the verge of being evicted and flooded uh, with false figures and false data and claims that go around. You know, I said at the beginning that you were a heroine and for millions you were a legend and an inspiration, but for the urban upper classes, you're a threat. They often see you as a publicity seeker. How do you see them in return? That again is a challenge and that... Uh, you know, helps me to work with uh, most humility at my command, uh, thanks to them that they keep challenging. But when they sometimes uh, defame with false allegations, someone coming up from the corporate sector and saying that we take foreign funds which we don't, I have to fight back uh, filing the criminal defamation cases as I have. But otherwise, uh, if someone raises a question out of genuine difference of opinion or a different perspective, one has to respect an answer. But when allegations but are times, made and uh, when they're defamatory, do you get hurt easily? Not really, because you have to stand by your conscience and uh, really take the support from within. And as long as you know what you're doing and what you're doing is... Uh, not unjust or uh, inhuman and not even illegal in the real sense. Uh, Gandhiji, to everyone who have fought these kinds of uh, paradigms and uh, regimes, give us the strength and the ideals. Let's talk a bit about you personally. In 1976, you got married to Praveen Patkar. Was that a love marriage? I don't generally answer questions uh, as personal as that, uh, Karanchi, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I'm alone now and I'm happy and there is nothing newsy about uh, either my marriage no, life I didn't mean or the life I'm leading today. I didn't mean it in a newsy sense. I meant that you've been through a marriage that is a broken marriage. Was that difficult for you to handle emotionally? No, was it not a trauma? at all. It was very smooth and we were mature individuals and uh, we could see that our ways are different and that was it. Uh, would you consider getting married again or do you find that no, you now I'm don't have the time? I'm married to my cause now. That is sufficient for you? Yes, I have a larger family. But do you ever feel that you might want your own children? Do you regret not having children? No, I don't. There are so many in our life schools. It sounds as if you dedicated yourself to the point at which you perhaps sublimated the individual Medha. Medha, the person doesn't count. Medha, the worker is what matters. It's not that. I think everyone cares for oneself. Uh, I eat and I sleep and I <laughs> drink, uh, not hot drinks, of course. Uh, but uh, you have to rise above yourself if you have to really uh, be on to a cause that you have to take it to its ideal end and have to achieve goal. And I think women in general have that kind of an ability to persevere and uh, not leave it halfway. <laughs> Are you suggesting that women are somehow stronger in causes like this? Yes, of course. Why not? <laughs> it's not just in this year of women's empowerment that comes from the top, but uh, it's through the whole processes of uh, empowering ourselves and uh, through the born strength that the women function. 
from family to the fields and uh, I think we have proved this to the world. But you know you used a very interesting phrase a moment ago, you said one has to rise above oneself when one's associated with a cause like the Narmada Bachao Andolan. Is it easy however to rise above yourself? I think we all do it in different contexts. Uh, it's nothing uh, superhuman or inhuman uh, to oneself uh, because uh, I think when someone really uh, prays to the God or uh, you know submits uh, or surrenders in different situations, uh, you do that. Do you now, whether you do it for an ideological, I think uh, all human beings are like gods and goddesses for me. But uh, I'm saying that uh, this kind of effort to go beyond oneself uh, takes place within the familial context as well. So it's just up to you to really decide what canvas uh, you want to choose and work on and what paintings uh, you have to draw. You talked about the canvas an individual chooses to work on. How long will you choose to work on the Narmada Bachao canvas and will you ever be attracted towards more active politics, electoral politics, parliament? Our agenda has always been uh, beyond Narmada and Narmada is symbolic of the development paradigm but it's Narmada Bachao, Mano Bachao as it is uh, on our batch as well and it's also the Ish Bachao in the present kind of uh, valueless politics, so criminal and communal politics. I don't mean to interrupt you but does this mean that you will consider more active electoral politics? No, I don't have plans uh, till date, but I am in the people's politics through the National Alliance of People's Movements towards building a, a strong popular force that would challenge, question the politics, interact with it, not say no to electoral politics, but at the same time fulfill not that. Not say no to electoral politics, so parliament is a possibility sometime in the future? Not in the near future. But in the distant future? It may not uh, be ever. But you are <laughs> not saying no, are you? No one can say no to anything that one accepts be a part of the socio-political economic reality. But uh, it's here again for everything that is personal is political for me and uh, politics is not narrowed down to electoral politics. So I am in politics already. And in a sense that is your life, you've dedicated yourself to it. So moving to parliament whether it happens near or in the far future would be a logical culmination. I don't see it as that. I see the logical end in the present phase and the process as building a strong people's power that would challenge the communal and criminal politics of today. And I've just come from Gujarat and seeing what is happening there is uh, heart burning. Mehta Parkar, a pleasure having you on the program. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed.